Caitlin O'Connell has passionately devoted over 20 years of her research career to the study of elephants. She's the author of the internationally acclaimed Elephant Secret Sense, as well as a photography book, An Elephant's Life. She's a faculty member in the Department of Ultra, um, this is a tough one, Otolaryngology, <laughs> Otolaryngology, head and neck surgery in the Stanford School of Medicine and has taught science writing for Stanford University and the New York Times. When she's not studying elephants, Caitlin is running the nonprofit organization Utopia Scientific. Her latest book is A Baby Elephant in the Wild, and she has an upcoming book on male elephant society coming out with University of Chicago Press next spring. Please welcome Caitlin O'Connell to the JCCSF. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming tonight. I, uh, it's, it's a dark time for elephants in Africa. And um, I thought rather than focusing on that, we're going to focus on how great elephants are and how amazingly similar they are to us, how their societies are set out, um, long-lived intelligent animals. They have the same politics that we do. And I think the more that we focus on that, the more we might make better decisions about how to protect them. So my title is The Secret Life of Elephants. And what I'd like to do is just give you an overview of their life and, and some of our research and some of what we've been able to learn and apply back to elephant conservation. Now, elephant behavior can be extremely explicit, but I think many people think that elephants can also be very subtle. <laughs> now that we know that they're self-aware, you know, this is the next step. It's a little hard to interpret their behavior, and sometimes even more difficult to interpret their behavior. And so this is what we have to deal with in the wild. Um, but let me get a little more explicit about what I mean by how subtle these behaviors are. So let's take these two elephants up here. This old gentleman, Stoli, is standing next to the young Jack who's trying to get his trunk into the trough. And that position is the source of the spring, and elephants like to drink fresh water. And it's very symbolic um, show of dominance. Let me turn this one on. Um, to put your trunk in with the dominant bull, can I get away with that? And the dominant bull has to decide, hmm, is this guy going to cause trouble if I let him do that? So here, Jack is trying to get his trunk right there. And Stoli's like, ah, you know, you're just not ready for this, I don't know. And so he's persistent, but then Stoli chooses a non-aggressive way to distract him. I'll just use you as a scratching post. You're really not ready for this. <laughs> so there's very nice, gentle old bulls out there. But there's also another strategy. This guy's like, well, geez, if the dominant bull's not going to drink at the end, I'm going to. And he's like, no way, buddy. Sorry. Uh-uh. Give him a little tusk in the rump and send him on his way. So there's lots of different characters, a lot of different strategies for how to um, orchestrate your environment, how to deal with social situations. Here's an extended family reunion. Um, the elephants are long-lived. They are migratory. They live in matriarchal societies where the young males will move out of the families and into bull groups or associations. Um, these animals grow up within very strong, tight-knit families, uh, where mom is the first member of the family that the baby uh, learns about. And this is uh, Liza, the star of the baby elephant book, and her mom, Winona. Um, so once they are born and they bond with mom, then they have all these great extended family um, Playmates. They have siblings, they have cousins, then they have extended visits from other cousins, and they drink together, they play in the mud together, they 
really, the, the females in these groups will bond for life. Um, now, they also have very similar rituals to ours. This trunk-to-mouth greeting, where you place your trunk in the other one's mouth, is exactly the same thing as a handshake, a sign of respect, um, a salute sometimes to a much more senior member, and it's, it's learned at a very young age. Um, social bonds within extended fa families are developed and reinforced through these reunions, through tactile greeting rituals, and through vocalizations. Now, new matriarchs, it's interesting to know that um, they are not the next, they are not the daughter of the matriarch, they are the next oldest member of the family becomes the matriarch. This has um, been studied in Kenya, and what that means is that knowledge is more important than blood. Now, we're finding some discrepancies here that I'll t tell you a little bit about. But let's talk about matriarch character, because that really defines the group. Some of them can be tentative, curious, uh, some are more wary, and some will charge first and ask questions later. And then uh, a more confident matriarch will assess danger before doing anything about it. Now, these confident matriarchs also help make a better plan, a more reasonable plan. This is um, Big Mama, and she and another younger member of the family kneel down together and pull a baby out of the trough. Very coordinated, no fuss, just, okay, we go down and pick the baby up. Whereas in another scenario, this is Mia of the athletes. She's a very young matriarch, and she, you can see her uh, group of very young females. They don't really know what to do, but she just scoops the baby out for them. But then you have another situation where everyone's like, well, I, I don't know what to do. If I pull here, will that help? Or maybe not. Um, so the level of coordination really goes with the experience of the matriarch. And just another benefit to these sort of uh, coalitions, uh, coordinated behavior, this is Big Mama, and she's lining up to charge a, a, a female from another area that has come in and taken over the water hole. And she's like, no, wait, no, this is our home. You're not doing that. And they come marching in very formidable, but they don't win. Here's the, the uh, in, interloper just scatters them, chases them off, which is really surprising. Um, but it's just another one of those mysteries. I would have thought she could beat them, but um, it, maybe she's too nice, I don't know. Um, now, another question is, when you look at character development of these uh, family members that, that play such a dominant role in your life, you have to wonder, well, what kind of influences does that character have on the next generation? So my title here is, Do Cowgirls Beget Cowboys? Now, character can be shaped at a very young age, influenced by the matriarch, mother, siblings, and the, the rank of their mothers. Now, from a very early age, you can see this kind of activity where one could pull on a baby's trunk and become a bully, whereas another one would reach out and say, no, no, stop, that maybe um, the peacemakers are stopping the bullies. I don't know, but they've got the same thing going on with these youngsters. Some of them are pushing, always you know, teasing, teasing, and other ones, no, no. Um, so it's kind of interesting to then map that against their mothers and their matriarchs to see what kinds of characters you get. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, some family members that we're seeing are, as an animal form language, are more equal than others. If a matriarch's um, offspring interacts with the lower-ranking offspring, there seems to be ramifications. There seems to be a bloodline that's drawn at the offspring of the mothers, which then would call into question if the matriarch is the next in line, if the next oldest is the next matriarch, how could that be if there's already this bias between bloodline and uh, lower ranking individuals outside that bloodline? So that's something that we're currently working on. Um, but here is an extended family, and just to show you how these ranking situations work, 
As this extended group comes to the waterhole, as they get closer, the lower-ranking individuals know that there's no way that they're going to get on this trajectory and get to the head of the trough, so they are going to go all the way around the back and drink in the very salty pan. Whereas this group knows there's no question about it, I've got a beeline for the best water, and I'm going straight for it, and I'm going to get it. Whereas this group is like, well, I'm not even going to bother because I know what will happen. And this is where, again, this question of royalty, and I wrote an article about that in um, Smithsonian Magazine, March 2013, if you want to read more about that. Um, one character in this situation was particularly dramatic, um, Paula and her new calf, Bruce. We saw three females, uh, low-ranking females in three different families being ostracized, pushed out. And this is her baby, he's losing milk, she's having a hard time protecting him, and, and she's not even allowed to stand in with the rest of the group and help shade the baby. So there's something really off, off going on here, and we think, well, if optimal foraging theory says that you have a minimum size in order to maintain fitness, and that might be 15 up to 30 individuals, people had always talked about it as a passive process, not an actively forcing out of the lower-ranking individuals. So, Again, this is something that we've come up with in the last couple of years, and we don't quite understand it. Maybe a desert culture with so little water has to be more rigorous in defining their group sizes, um, which comes out to not very nice behavior to the lower-ranking individuals. Um, now, we're also looking at gender differences between calves versus the um, ranking of mom. And we find that male calves stray further than mom, and dominant calves tend to be more social. Now, when a young bull starts to mature, he starts to do what a lot of human bulls will do, and go out and cause trouble. Cause trouble with other species that are dangerous, and even more dangerous, and cause trouble with his siblings. And finally, mom says, OK, it's time to go which he is not happy about, he is happy about, he's not happy about. Um, this goes on for several years. But what happens in the end, you can see how he towers over the rest of his family. It's pretty much time to go. And so he has to figure out how he's going to negotiate this society of adult males, which looks sort of like an intimidating wall. But when you look closer, you'll see that each one of these guys has a particular character, some of them like to take in youngsters, and some of them don't. Um, now, in this whole population of over 200 males that we're monitoring, we have a catalog set out to be able to tell who's who, and this is our most dominant bull, Greg. Uh, this is Willie Nelson here and Gakulu. <laughs> and it does really help to have names as well as ear tags and numbers. It, um, it does help. Now let's go to Namibia, where these field studies um, take place. Elephants in Namibia live in the desert, scrub desert, woodland savanna, and riverine habitats. This is Atasha National Park. So in Africa, this is where Namibia is on the southwest coast. Uh, Atasha is towards the top. And we are up here in the northeast corner of the park. And just to show you that corner of the park, it has elephant-proof fencing, but the elephants don't really care about that. Um, this is the dry season pattern and wet season. There is corn out here, and we're going out to get it. So those are some of the issues that one has to deal with. Every day, the fencing team has to fix the fence. Um, we help them when we're there by measuring footprints and trying to figure out who the culprits are and how to minimize uh, these conflicts. Uh, figure out what about the electrical fencing we can help um, make stronger. But this is our field site. It's a temporary camp with a permanent tower and a bunker. This is 20 meters from the waterhole, 80 meters from the waterhole, and this is where most of our action happens. Now, it's strange to be a tourist where you are standing by yourself watching the world go by. Usually you are moving through the environment, but here the animals are moving through the environment and defining your day for you. Our, our bull day starts about 10, 30, 11 in the morning. 
goes throughout much of the day, and then by the late afternoon, evening, the families finally show up, and then they come into the night. And here is the inside of our camp with our camp kitchen, and everything's run off of solar. Now, to get down to the business of figuring out behavior as you're sitting in your research platform and there's all these guys out there interacting, how do you make sense of it? You know, there's really affiliative behaviors and then aggressive behaviors. Who does what to whom when and uh, how do we make sense of it? So here's Greg, here's how you interpret this situation here. He is walking into the waterhole. We have the second and third ranking bulls at the head of the trough. But now they see him, they were drinking, now they see him, they're going to leave because they don't want any problems with the Don when they're trying to drink at the head of the trough, they'll just let him drink. And his mid-ranking best buddy here, turn, he faces him square on. Now, penis signaling is really important in elephants, and he's sort of dropped his penis, he's a little bit scared. Um, and he turns sideways. And so he's, he's not going to confront him, turn sideways, let him go. And that's how you would score this interaction. You would say, um, so Greg, um, Greg, and aggressive, let's say, aggressive ear flap towards Kevin, which is the second ranking bull. So in the moment, you um, type in your data logger exactly what's happening between each one of those bulls, and you can put together a score sheet. And if you look at Greg, he does not lose at any time, except for with Gakulu, the big Zulu bull. Um, that's the only bull that he will win only half the time. So this is how you can put together a score sheet and put this together over years. So what you can do if you're doing this for several years in a row, you can say, okay, so Greg is the most dominant, and this is a linear hierarchy uh, with all of the other bulls, means that uh, a always wins contest with B, C, D. But when you have a really wet year, so climate has an impact on social interactions here. Um, in dry years, your affiliative behaviors, you're more affiliative. In wet years, you're more aggressive. What happens, there's not as much um, oversight over the youngsters. They get a little more aggressive and feisty. They might even show signs of must because they don't have to kowtow to the Don and drink only from one spot. They can go anywhere. So this is how, as an example of how the environment can define certain social interactions. And in all of that data that we collect, we're also looking at who's associated with who and how often do they come in together and how bonded are they from year to year. The other thing that we collect are hormones and DNA from their fecal samples. So we know each one of these bulls in here, who they are, and we collect. This is brought back in from out here. We have a fecal map, and so we know that, you know, Dave on July 7th is right there, and <laughs> we keep a pretty close eye on the situation. Um, and, and that helps us look at, at cortisol levels, stress throughout the season, stress after a specific interaction, or um, testosterone levels during must, as well as looking at relatedness across the population, and is there some uh, correlation between associations and relatedness, which there seems to be. Now, a few minutes on um, acoustics and the night work. Um, it's an amazingly beautiful place to study at night. This is a time lapse of elephants coming in, uh, viewed from the bunker. Um, I'm going to read a paragraph out of the book I wrote in 2007 during this period while I was studying the elephants. Now, those were two very fast videos, but this is, this is the pace of an elephant. He's going to decide if he's going to move forward. It was after twilight on a new moon night when I saw three bulls on the northern horizon just before closing into the bunker for the night. I sat on top and waited for them to walk in. In the near darkness, I felt like I was suddenly in the depths of an open ocean, sitting within my little submersible, phosphorescent stars suspended in the distance as the bulls approached. 
Their gait was so soft and fluid that they seemed to float in a luminescent sea like blue whales in a bottomless expanse. The major and minor Magellanic clouds in the Milky Way looking like the spouting of water through elephantine blowholes in the deep. A soft padding of heels flowed by me as the bulls walked past the bunker and onto the waterhole. Just ten feet away, three pairs of eyes remained forward, not even a sideways glance towards me, although I knew they were aware of my presence by the position of their trunk. Just the tip towards me, absorbing my scent as they passed. Their breathing was slow and methodical through the ends of lanky trunks held inches above the ground. With one exhalation after another, they calmly took me in as if everything was in order. I had finally become part of the scenery to them. The more I immersed myself in their world, the more questions I had, even down to the simple positioning of their feet while walking. Over time, I saw that an elephant's mood could be determined by its footfalls. If it was calm, it would place its weight on its heels like these bulls were doing. But if it was upset or nervous and felt the need to be stealthy, it would place its weight on its toes and literally tiptoe. And that's when I started to focus on how much time they spent leaning forward on their feet and listening for vibrations. So this is a bull vocalization in the range of 10 hertz, and it's actually um, a chorus between two bulls, which hasn't been described. Um, the bulls are quite vocal, just like the females are when they depart. Bonded bulls will engage in interactive vocalizations, just like the females. The females fundamental frequency is about 20. The males are that much bigger than the females, and their vocalization falls in the 10, 10 hertz. Now, what's interesting here is that if you put out a microphone array by 800 meters, most of this is gone. So it's really the lower frequencies that propagate into the distance, and that's what these uh, individuals are, are, are queuing into. And the patterns that these calls um, we're calling them interactive vocalizations, where let's say the matriarch says, okay, it's time to go and I emit my rumble. Well, you, the next in line is waiting until she's finished, and then they start their rumble, and then the next one starts the rumble. So what they do is take a three-second call and make it into nine seconds, and then repeat it more often. So these calls can be detected much further away um, than just one individual calling on their own. Now, part of my time was spent working with farmers to try and help them keep elephants out of their fields. So this is something that I did to see if I could help them. And this is a call that I'm playing back to them in the context of lions hunting. Elephants are nervous. So I'm playing it from the bunker, and the matriarch comes up to see what is going on here. And then it's these three calls that really elicit a response. From a management perspective, this is um, pretty successful. Um, but of course, when we play this, we, you know, we have to be very careful and make sure the elephants drink enough, and you don't want them to habituate. But, you know, every year in Africa, there's different crises and different situations that one might use, whether you can use um, um, bee, no beehive noises or, or this kind of call. It's always going to have to change, but you always have to try something. And, and this was one of the things that we tried. Um, but because I knew exactly what these elephants uh, would do, I got really curious about another behavior, and that is this freezing behavior coordinated with the group. So these elephants are about to leave the waterhole, but they, they suddenly freeze, and then sometimes they freeze mid-stride, really often put, taking one foot off the ground and placing more weight on the others. And, you know, even the little ones are doing it. This often is, is um, coordinated with the arrival of another group or some kind of seismic noise, a vehicle. And so I wanted to see if we played back signals, known signals into the ground, would elephants be able to respond? We had already figured out that their um, high sound pressure level vocalizations travel in the ground. So 
um, at tw 120 uh, decibels, an elephant rumble couples with the surface of the ground and propagates along the surface of the ground. Well, we wanted to know if elephants actually use that. And so we took um, some shakers and some geophones, and this from the car industry and the home theater industry. You mount them to your, your joist of the house, and you get some nice rumbles. Um, very convenient for us. So we, we, um, we calibrate our systems such that we know that there's only the signal coming out of the ground and nothing coming out of the air and about what the um, expected signal would be. And so we let the elephants come in, we let them drink, and then at uh, a time that's not known to the observers, we start the experiment. And we're looking for freezing behavior, for bunching up into tighter groups. So here's the freeze, and then they'll bunch up into their tighter family groups, and then they leave the water hole much sooner than they would if they didn't have this presentation. So here's the types of data that we collect. Uh, and it worked so well that we wondered, well, what if we take a familiar call and an unfamiliar call of the same context and see how sophisticated are they in detecting uh, Auntie Mabel from some distant cousin that they'd never met. So we put these two calls into the ground and found that they were much more responsive to the familiar call than they were to the unfamiliar call. So that means there's a pretty sophisticated level of vibration detection going on in their feet and trunks. Which got us curious about, well, if we were to give an elephant a, a foot test, just like a hearing test, how would we go about doing that? Well, we started by going to the Oakland Zoo, and Colleen Kinsley kindly let us work with the lovely Donna here. Donna the elephant is standing on a force plate with a, um, a thumper underneath it. So she will be able to tell us when she feels vibration. So it's designed just like a hearing test where you reduce the level by 6 dB, by 12, by 18. And once she fails the experiment, which is 50 force choice experiments, then she goes up to 3 dB down, and you oscillate around a threshold and figure out that's the sensitivity of her feet. Well, let's watch them at work here. Good girl, Donna. Good so she girl. touches the middle target um, to start. She'll touch the triangle when she doesn't feel a vibration. No vibration, touch the triangle. She gets a treat. Now we turn the level of vibrations up so you can hear a, th a clicking sound. So that sound that she's cueing into, um, Such a good girl. but under normal circumstances yes. she won't hear that, we're just doing it for the video. So then she goes down and once she realizes what we're doing and she really wants to succeed, she gets better and better at focusing. Well and then we got a little greedy about what else we could ask her to do and thinking about her, the largest cerebral cortex, uh, particularly the temporal lobe and the capacity for memory and spatial learning. And we all say that elephants have this great memory, but what is the proof? How can we really nail down, um, aside from building anecdotes, how can we test this? So we got some bananas, and we present her with a banana and have her select a picture of a banana. What that means is if you can represent an object in your mind, that means you can plan around that object. You can think, okay, there's a marula fruit tree. I know when it ripens. I know how to get to it. Um, oops. Um, so it's the first step in understanding long-term memory is to show that you can visualize uh, an object in your mind that, that is representative of a real thing. So that's where we're at with her, and then you have to do further challenges of, okay, if we put a pumpkin in the bull yard, but we show her a picture of where it is, would she be able to tell from that picture where um, the pumpkin is? So that's for later. But for now, it's, she's a pretty interesting subject. Now, this next piece, we're always trying to add some conservation component to what we're doing. And when we played back uh, vocalizations to the females, the, the um, alarm calls, the males didn't really care. But we want to know more about how they're detecting these signals, so we play back an estrus call. Now this, this we get some results. So we're looking 
looking at how he's spending a lot of time on the ground, flapping his ears, pressing down on the ground with his trunk, and he comes right past the source. This is the source right here. Goes right past it, keeps on going, looking for his lovely lady. As urgent as an elephant can be at high speed. Um, This worked so well with Beckham that we thought, wow, what a great tool. What are we going to do with this? Um, what we realized is that must bulls travel far and wide looking for females, and they often break through fences, get outside the park, and cause trouble. And once they're out there, how do you get them back in? You know, they fly with a helicopter, they shoot in the air, and it's all traumatic and aggressive. Well, what if you just invite him back in? <laughs> so we're busy working with the rangers to set up a system to, by every 500 meters, invite the elephant back into the park, because it, it, it's a beeline. It was very impressive. He, he, he can really localize that signal. The other conservation application in the midst of measuring um, vocalizations and footfalls in the ground, you can hear that sound. This is an elephant walking across the geophone. Now, it's... Um, it's a, the, the earth is an elastic medium, and, and sound comes from walking on it. This is a whole herd walking across this spot. And what's interesting here is that the elephant footfall, the, the weight of the foot as they, as they walk, is may, very similar to the human. And we have figured out an algorithm to extract each one of these species so that you could do a remote censusing uh, with, a, with a seismic instrument and know how many elephants and what time of day uh, they came into the waterhole. <clears throat> so we're working on that. But in the midst of this, then the whole poaching crisis has evolved, and so we've come up with three tiers. We can easily separate out human footfalls, gunshots, uh, even turn on cameras when something bad is happening. Um, so we're developing a whole series of these sensors, uh, again, in three phases, uh, detect poachers, uh, to provide an early warning system of elephants approaching farms, or in India, we're working with a group to stop elephants from getting hit by uh, trains, and also monitoring. The third phase would be a passive long-term system where text message or uh, whatever kind of information could be sent back to the ranger station, but this is in areas where they can't afford to go out and monitor all the time. So showing a police presence is one thing, but otherwise, just conservation-wise, who's using what hole when? And, and all of a sudden, this month, no one's using this water hole. What happened? They go out and they find out the water hole was broken or the pump broke. Um, so that kind of thing is what we've been designing. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is a biomimetic uh, hearing aid for people with hearing impairments that was developed from this research on the vibrotactile sensitivity of the elephant's foot, where people with hearing impairments um, devote a lot of their um, real estate in their brain to uh, vibrations. So they have a somatosensory cortex like we do, but their auditory cortex is not receiving information from sound, so they process vibrations through the auditory cortex as well. So they have double the amount of real estate dedicated to vibrations, so they're incredibly sensitive to vibrations, and we're developing a tool that would help with either building a language or even just um, basic things around the house, like the doorbells ringing, or um, the military is interested in it for strategic purposes to communicate by the hand where they can't speak between walls and, and that kind of thing. Um, these are the people we'd like to acknowledge uh, funding and collaborators, and I'm um, happy to answer any questions. Oh, we have a question, Caitlin, right here in the front. How long would an average bull elephant's trunk be? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, well, you know they can expand. 
One way to think about that, I know at the Oakland Zoo, they, they looked at how much water an elephant trunk could suck up, and it was nine liters. Now, that's because there's two nari, so that's two on either side, but um, whew, people normally measure at the shoulder, like the, the tallest bull I think I've, that's known is 14 meters. No, that's not right, not meters. Um, let's see, over two meters, but that's at the shoulder. That's a very good question. Because <laughs> the thing is, once they come out like that, they can stretch it for a really long way, especially a must bull, because they like to swing it around like a fire hose. And I, we're going to have to ask, um, hmm, where's Colleen Kinsley? We're going to have to ask her that question. Colleen, can you answer that question? Wait a minute, I'm coming to you. Colleen, where are you? Is that you? Here. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> uh, Save you know, me. <laughs> You know, we give a 10-foot reach distance. So for the big male, he can reach about 10 feet. And like Caitlin said, they can stretch their trunk out. So at its most stretched out, probably about 10 feet. Well, that's a good one. OK. So you have to watch out when the trunk, they, they like to whack you. Well, whack each other when they're you know, disciplining a young bull. They, our ne they our know next the question distance. over here yep. to your right. Some more questions on numbers. Uh, age of uh, how long, how many years just, or how long gestation? What's their uh, age, how, how, the age expectancy, and how long before they're sexually mature? Okay, um, gestation is 22 months, so almost two years. Um, and, uh, Life expectancy, you asked a bunch of questions. Oh, uh, it's sexual maturity. For the uh, females, they can um, mate, you know, let's say nine-ish. Uh, the males, more like 12 to 15. But really, if they're in a population with adult males, they'll never be able to mate until they can compete for must and, uh, unless they can sneak. But I'd say on average for a male, it would be 20 to 25 to be really competitive, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen earlier than that. Um, and they leave their families between 12 and 15, but they can't really get away with going into must unless the older bulls are not around, which can happen in a wet season. We can get a half-sized bull in must. And then you asked uh, longevity, how, how long do they live? Well, that's um, been kind of a bone of contention between how long they can live in captivity versus the wild. The biggest limiting factor is uh, when their last two, so they've got six sets of teeth and they move forward. They're, as they grind food, it moves forward. And then they have one last set when their six molar drops out and they can't eat anymore. That would happen in the wild more than it would in captivity. Um, then if they have a young bull that would help chew their food and give it to them, that can happen sometimes. But the, any safe range would be between 60 and 90, but I don't think people are saying 90 anymore because um, in a captive environment, if all goes well, still you have foot problems. Um, at, at zoo, captive elephants tend to die of, of not natural causes um, due to not being able to migrate, so it's usually foot problems. Caitlin, we have a question here at the top, but first would you explain must, because there were some questions about must. Oh, yes. So must is a fascinating phenomenon. It's like redding an antelope. You know, the, the males will corral the females, and they all go into this heightened state of testosterone at once and see how many females they can corral and mate with. Well, male elephants are a little more gentlemanly about it. They take turns. So only one male is in must at any one time, and another male might not be happy about it, but the more dominant individuals tend to get the must window that matches the um, female estrus period peaks. Uh, and, and then it goes downhill from there, which period you can kind of wrangle yourself into. Here's a question up at the top here. First of all, thank you so much for all this wonderful research and storytelling. I'm curious about two things. Number one is you talked about confident matriarchs. So I'm curious about just the um, emotional intelligence of these animals and how that comes to be in nature versus nurture, number one. And then number two, um, 
you know, we know they're challenged, and I don't want to cry, but just That's maybe right, I almost us, did yeah. in the beginning. <laughs> oh, sorry, I missed the she, last she part. She said, tell us a couple of things about the challenges. Oh. Um, you're going to make me cry now. <laughs> um, but the first part was talking about how intelligent they are, and um, can you summarize that first part? Just um, like nature In versus nurture, and you talked about the really confident matriarchs, and like how does that come to be? Like, like how are some confident versus not confident, and just their okay. emotional intelligence? Um, well, let me tell you a story about emotional intelligence, and I'm going to focus on Greg, uh, because the females, um, there's some really amazing uh, matriarchs, very wise and not letting any trouble. And then, and then I see situations where, boy, these, these low-ranking females are totally brutalized, and, and their, their calves are not allowed to socialize with other calves. So I think, what is going on here? And I, and I hope it's a pattern of really dry desert environment and, like, you know, we got to... Uh, cut our losses and only take the immediate family. Um, but on a, on a more interesting, happier note, I want to talk about Greg because nobody said... So in primates, male primates, being on top of the heap is to be able to make, you know, mate with the most females, but they don't make the... They're not the leaders. The females are the leaders, and they go off and make the choices, and the males just sort of come along and, like, who do I mate with next? Um, but in elephants, I honestly believe there is some choices that are made that are related to the benefit of the whole group. And, and that's not really talked about, that males do this, but there is a benefit to being in a group, for sure. You can protect, you can do these coalitions and kick somebody else out that you don't want. But Greg, the dominant bull that we've been monitoring all this time, he really pulls in the youngsters. The younger bulls are so emotional, they really need to have interaction. They grew up in these families, and they're desperate to touch and just play. And, and so some of the older males get grouchy, and they don't want to deal with them. But a lot of them do, and they solicit this. Well, you wouldn't think the most dominant one would do this, but he does. He's got this balance between carrot and stick, where uh, he'll protect the top-ranking individuals from bullies, like Abe is a high-ranking individual, one of his best buddies, and Kevin is a third-ranking bully, and he constantly is at Abe, constantly. And when Greg has the opportunity, he will just put Kevin in his spot and just slam him down. And it, so watching him over the years makes you really impressed, like, wow, there's benevolent dictators in this kind of society. It's not all about just being on top and being the most vicious in order to stay on top. There's a negotiation going on, and that, that's really impressive. And the second part of her question was about, uh, to summarize just some of the challenges today. Um, fortunately, um, in Atasha National Park, you don't see the kinds of devastation that's happening in other areas. So my uh, subjects that I've grown to know and love so well, I haven't seen them be decimated like, like other places in the Congo, the um, field site there, and um, places that in Zimbabwe that have been poisoned. Um, it's, it's just, it's gotten to a ridiculous height, and I think that you can get overwhelmed and feel like, what could you possibly do? And so my choice has been to just be an evangelical about how great elephants are, and we really need to pay attention to them, and here's why. And, and that's what I've chosen to do. Um, but I think for people who have watched their subjects get brutalized and shot with arrows and guns, and uh, I don't know if I could be that strong. Our next question up here on your right. Um, 
I, I know you said earlier that you were going to talk about the pumpkin experiment, so I was wondering if you could go into that a little bit more, maybe also discuss uh, in more detail about elephant memory and maybe, I think, self-awareness as they maybe have a little bit of that as well. Okay. Um, recently, so there's always a question, and if any of you saw the latest AI movie with Johnny Depp, uh, of are you conscious? So is this machine that Johnny Depp has become, is he conscious? And the, the feisty machine will answer you and say, well, I don't know if I'm conscious, are you conscious? Um, and and that, we kind of have to deal with that with animals. How are we going to ask them this question? What is this self-awareness test? Uh, it's been done with primates. Um, it, you can see in birds pecking at themselves in the mirror that some birds do not, are not self-aware because they think it's the enemy. So the idea is you look yourself in the mirror and for the elephant experiment, they put a white spot on the elephant and the elephant gets to observe itself. And if the elephant touches that spot and notices that it's something different, that's a sign that they are seeing themselves and that something has changed. And they have been able to do this. Um, which some of these things seem obvious, but you, you know, as a scientist, you have to show it. And that's what we were trying to do with Donna at the Oakland Zoo, was to show, okay, we have all these wonderful stories about um, elephants remembering other elephants that they had been separated for for 20 years, or a favorite trainer, or the voice of that trainer, but to really systematically um, make an experiment to show that this is how memory works, and these are the steps to get there. So our first step in showing that elephants have long-term memory is to say, I recognize this picture as a real object. Second step would be um, take that image and challenge the elephant further. So that image now is not just a banana, it's the bullyard that she knows, and there's a pumpkin, her favorite treat, sitting in a specific place in the bullyard. So if you present her with that picture, will she then go exactly to that spot in the bullyard? That's, that's another level. And then there, there's a lot of um, other experiments that we've tried to do using voice and olfaction and Im images to evoke, because some animals have, we have a very strong olfactory memory, so we're trying to set up an experiment with a trainer that hasn't seen an elephant for 20 years and first go back in with smells of, say, five different women and have the elephant see if they can select that one smell and then voice of five different women, see if, the, if there's recognition of that one and then finally the presentation of that person. So those are the kinds of things that you could do to add rigor and, and systematic uh, level of experimentation to say, yes, they really did recognize that person from 20 years ago, and these are the levels that they recognized, and olfactory was more important, was visual, more, it's more likely to be olfaction than visual, but, um, so those are the kinds of things. The next question's up here at the top. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the second eldest female becomes a matriarch. Is there a process or rituals around that? Well, that's a very good question, and um, this has just been described based on um, genetic data and, and some observations, and this was done by a group in Kenya that I haven't um, uh, been involved in those studies. Um, what I see, you know, a lot of times things are published, and they have to be published in their simplest form, but there is a lot of slop. So I see that uh, older females, much older females, can have what looks like uh, uh, dementia. Um, the, there's a takeover before a, a matriarch dies sometimes. That's what I've seen. Um, and at what point? Well, it seems obvious um, you know, to us when, okay, grandma can't walk very well anymore and she has to lag behind and we're going to help her, but um, she can't make decisions. So you kind of see this gradual shift over uh, to the next fittest. Now, this is the idea from the Kenya group that it's the next fittest individual will take the charge and say, okay, we're going to move this way and we know that she's not able to make this decision anymore and then we move on. But the way it's been described, it's that that one dies. But I don't, it's not that simple. They, they don't just die and then 
the next one becomes mechok. It's a gradual um, loss of fitness and inability to make decisions, and then the others will take over. Now, whether or not it's bloodline versus next oldest and wisest, maybe it's some combination, but uh, from what we're seeing with how they treat the lower-ranking females, it doesn't seem like it's not bloodline, but we have to prove that, so I hope I answered your question. Our next question over here, up front. Um, good evening. So given that family structure, um, when you look at something like the Sheldrick Foundation that is um, taking in uh, orphans and then releasing them into the wild, and what you're describing as having to keep a family intact and therefore separating out already some of the families that are family members that are already there mm -hmm. for survival of the group in total. How do these orphans get adopted by existing families? It seems like, especially given man and devastation of man and devastation of the climate, that the last thing that a family would want is a stranger adopted in. And, and that is true. However, there are lots of situations where the group that they approach has already been pieced together from previously poached instances. A colleague of mine did a study in Tanzania where she looked at reforming of groups from fragments. And you can see from our low-ranking females that have been pushed out, I kind of hope, well, maybe they'll form a unit and then they'll be okay. Um, but I think with the Sheldrick example, I mean, it's wonderful what they're doing because in that area, it was needed. I mean, in Southern Africa, we've seen um, anthrax outbreaks and, and calves die, but there's so many elephants there that they felt like management issues needed to focus on something else. But for her, in that situation, it's great that she's doing that, and I think there are ways for elephants to be able to have that entree back to the wild, even within their own groups. If they have tight enough groups of a good enough age structure, they could be out on their own as that, that family. And they could meet up with other fragmented groups, but going to a core family uh, would be a lot more difficult. But maybe with a particular matriarch that was accepting, and, and you do see that, but most of the time, it's, you know, my family against everyone else. Next yes. Quest, next question's up at the top to your right. Oh, sorry. Can, we'll just take sorry. this one here because you, you've been trying to ask a question. Well, we need, we need to wait for you. Between the Indian elephant and the African elephant. So the question was? Physically or? Well, characteristics and... Um, well, the best thing I can say as a quick answer um, is that People say that the Asian elephant is more like a cat and the African elephant is more like a dog. <laughs> and that means the African elephant is a little more forgiving, really wants to please you, and this is coming from trainers. They really want to please you and they want to do the right thing, whereas a cat's like, hmm, do I like you? I don't know. <laughs> the Asian elephant is the cat. Um, but that, you know, that's silly, but that's kind of, uh, I've seen that as an interesting um, uh, juxtaposition. But Asian elephants, I'm more afraid of them in the wild than I am African elephants. The pressure is just tremendous. Uh, and to see them in the wild and, and when they chase you and charge and don't stop, I understand. I just don't flatten me, but I understand. It's, um, it's pretty scary. <laughs> the next question's up at the top to your right. Could you tell us a little bit more about your own interaction with the elephants? How close you got? Did you sense they were aware of being observed? And did you ever feel they behaved in such a way that was affected by being observed? Well, um, elephants are very smart. So I know that they know that I'm there. Uh, I feel like there should be a respectful distance and I, I want to be in their world as a guest and watching how they interact with each other. I don't want them to interact with me, and so I don't solicit that, 
I'm sure, you know, after 20 years, I'm sure I could have that, but I don't think it's smart and fair to them um, because it, it just causes trouble for them. If It's like um, feeding a wild animal and they think, oh, it's okay to just go up to anybody and take that apple. Or, you know, uh, in South Africa, they have a, a target on the face of a baboon that you just gave um, a piece of food to. Basically, it's going to be dangerous for them to do that. And so I, I don't. Um, I, I, I miss that. I wish I could have that. Uh, it'd be great in the captive environment where it's more appropriate. Um, so what we do to try and minimize how they might uh, be affected by our presence is um, we stay, uh, we keep a distance, we're in the tower. When we want to do specific interactive experiments between individuals, we are removed. And yes, they can smell us. Um, but, you know, we wait for them to, you know, the first few days that we're there, they kind of settle down, oh, it's them again. They never give us any bananas. Who cares about them, you know? Um, so I don't know if I, if I answered you, but... Our next question right up here. Extremely uh, explaining ex any very clear that you've done, but I was curious, do you think that they recognize you? That after all these years, they see you coming, they smell you coming, they hear, they feel your footsteps? Well, I'm sure they, um, I'm sure some of the older individuals that are aware of keeping the family together and okay, this is the month that there's these, these people and some cars coming out and collecting our dung. <laughs> I, 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 yes, um, I do think that some of them, and some of them are little tricksters, like, ooh, what will they do if we pull this wire? Um, but I, you know, I, you know, it's not, no. I mean, it's not like me and Elsie the lion. It's, it's just, I, I keep my distance. I'd love to be friends with Willie Nelson and scrabble his ears every time I see him, but it's, um, I'll save that for my imagination. <laughs> Next question's up here again at the top. Um, the question concerns uh, images. Um, a mirror uh, for a binocular animal, uh, us or the elephant, has phase information. It has three-dimensional information. Um, and it sort of represents the real world. But um, I remember reading something 30 years ago that McLuhan wrote that in some tribal societies, people have, and I think it was a reference to a tribal society in Africa, when a picture, a photograph, let's say a photograph of a pumpkin, is presented, some of these folks, these humans, had no idea what they were looking at. They could not translate the two-dimensional information that didn't have phase information into an object representing anything in the world. So what about that artifact? That's fascinating. Um, I'm not sure I completely got what you said. I'm suggesting, I'm asking, have you considered the possibility that there's a radical difference between the mirror that they look into and can rep you know, recognize or give you information that suggests they recognize themselves, and the difference between that and a picture, a flat two-dimensional picture that represents a three-dimensional world object, and the possibility that like humans, like some humans, they'll have no idea what they're looking at. Um, yes, I think in the beginning she, because our previous tests had all been about tactile, oh, I'm, I'm being touched, that means I have to pay attention and, and make a judgment. But when we asked her to look at something, it was a completely different um, trick. It, it took a lot longer for her to realize, oh, you want me to focus on what? There's, oh, you mean that yellow stripe? Oh, that, oh, like the banana. <laughs> it took her a lot longer, um, and I, I think it would be interesting to compare three-dimensionality to two-dimensionality and, you know, show her a picture, or hold it up in the mirror and see if there, you know, what's that three-dimensional space? It makes sense that she'd be able to figure it out, um, but it's an interesting problem, and I don't know if I completely answered you, but it <laughs> We'll take two more questions. Our next question over here on your, or on your left. It may or may not be easier. Elephants and otolaryngology, what's up with that? <laughs> and, and if you'd like to dodge that one, I'm interested in what an ear, nose, and throat doctor notices about elephants. <laughs> 
Well, I won't dodge it, and I didn't put a picture in this um, talk tonight because it was more of a public lecture, but um, actually when we lose our hearing, so most of our knowledge about human hearing is based on the mouse model, and when we lose our high frequency hearing, all of that information is gone because the mouse is only up at two kilohertz. And the elephant um, audiogram is, is just like the human audiogram, except for it's a little bit lower. And so our hearing is much more similar to the elephant than to the mouse or chinchilla. Um, so that has its benefits. And obviously you can't keep five to the cage in the facility. You can't slice and dice and do brain sections or MRI even. Um, but there are a lot of things that you can learn about the cochlea, uh, about low frequency hearing sound production um, by other species that focus on that. And, and a, a few, there are a few of us around the country that are in these kinds of departments, either doing ultrasound or infrasound. So there's a couple of bat fo folks and myself and um, some whale folks. So that's the connection. Question to your right, about midway. Oh, first of all, thank you for the work that you're doing. It's, it's great. And I love baby elephants. And I'm, you mentioned the age of elephants. And I'm curious about weaning. And, and is there a variation depending upon group size? Um, can you mention anything about what's the normal time for a, a young elephant to be weaned and any trends you've noticed um, with some of the environmental uh, challenges? Yes. Um, well, you have gestation of 22 months. So while the one in the oven is gestating, the, the one outside is, is uh, nursing. So um, it's about a four to six year uh, length of time. Now, six years would be, you have to see if, if the next one is coming out, then there's um, the associated gap. So it's, it's on average four to six years. So I want to remind you, Caitlin will be signing books in the atrium. Thanks so much to all of you for being here tonight. Caitlin O'Connor, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.